Welcome. This webinar is about Context Institute's Bright Future program, which includes the Bright Future Now course and the Bright Future Network, which is composed of graduates from the course. I'm Robert Gilman. I'm the founder of Context Institute and the developer of the Bright Future program. The webinar is going to have three parts to it. The first part after this introduction is a presentation that I'm going to do about the framework that serves as important context for the whole Bright Future program. That's the first part. The second part, we have, we're fortunate to have here uh, nine graduates of the Bright Future Now program who are going to share some of both who they are and, uh, and their experiences with the program. Ah, it looks like we may have 10. That's great. Um, then after they've done that, hopefully both my presentation and what the graduates will share will have stirred up some questions. And so we will, in the third part, do Q&A, both panelists and myself, responding to whatever questions you may have. On to the presentation. And I want to start just with a recognition that these days, everybody recognizes that humanity is in a time of major change, but there's a lot of disagreement about what that means. If you're like many people, I can imagine you're concerned about the state of the world. I understand. As a sustainability educator and activist, I've been tracking the state of the world for decades, and there certainly is a great deal that's worrisome. But it may come as a surprise to you that in spite of all that is worrisome, I've come to feel that the bigger story is the potential of our times. And that potential shows up in many, many different ways. I just want to highlight two to begin with. The first of these is that we are at a time when there's really real capability for humanity to live in harmony with the earth. We know how to do that technically. Things that are blocking us are very human. And as we'll see, things that can indeed be overcome. We're also at a point where I would say that we have the potential within a decade, excuse me, a generation or two to end warfare as an institution. Both of these are well supported by current long-term trends. And they're just some of the characteristics of a future culture that's more possible than many people realize. We have an opportunity that our ancestors would have loved to have had. And future generations of all life, not just human life, call out to us to grab that opportunity. And it's my heart song that we follow that call and what we're doing with the Bright Future program is very much in response to that call. So this talk is intended to introduce you to a framework that can help you follow that call as well in a way that is practical, realistic, and fun. So it starts with an overview of human history that I've found over more than 30 years to be very helpful. It looks at the big picture of human culture, human cultural history, is made up of three stable eras and two big transitions. The first of those eras is what I call the tribal era. The tribal era was before 11,000 BC, more or less. There aren't sharp boundaries here. And during the tribal era, everyone's livelihood was hunting and gathering in one form or another. The advanced form of communication was speech. Social organization was all based around kinship, and it was really quite egalitarian. And leadership was pretty distributed, but if anyone had a special leadership status, it was the elders. Then, around 13,000 years ago, 11,000 BC or so, farming began. And it started off the first great transition. Human cultures went from being highly mobile to tied to the land. We went from being in bands of less than 100 
to settlements of up to tens of thousands of people. We went from having few material possessions to storable and stealable wealth. And the stealable wound up being pretty consequential because we went from a mostly peaceful existence to one that was militarized. And from that egalitarian quality to a strong social hierarchy. And by the time we get to around five and a half thousand years ago, we get to cities and writing and all of the various other things that go with what we think of as civilization. And that begins what I like to call the empire era. The empire era, extending over around 5,000 years, had agriculture as the prime form of livelihood. 90% of the population directly involved in agriculture as peasants, serfs, or slaves. The advanced form of communication was writing, and it was an elite form. Only about 10% of the population could read or write. The basis of social organization was violence enforced, religiously sanctioned hierarchy. And that's true around the globe. And the leadership was concentrated in a few dominating strongmen. This is a pattern that extended not only over thousands of years, but around the world. And it's most of what we think of when we think of our history. These two, the tribal era and the empire era, were really different. But both of them represent ways of being human, possible types of culture. And they illustrate how differently humans can put the pieces together. The next step in the story comes about 500 years ago in Europe, when another unstable transition begins. Perhaps it was the aftermath of the Great Plague or the political, political fragmentation in Europe, but whatever it was, the pace of innovation picked up and proved to be unstoppable. We're still in this transition. I put now up here pretty far along, and I think that we probably are fairly far, far along, uh, but we don't really know yet uh, just when the end of this current transition will come. You likely know, because it's recent history, you likely know a lot of what I like to describe as the superficial history about the Renaissance, the Reformation, the, uh, the Age of Enlightenment, all the political revolutions in both the United States and France and all over the place that happened you know, after that in, in Russia, China, many, many countries. And important innovations like the printing press, the development of the natural sciences, the industrial revolution, all that's happening these days with electronics. All of this is part of this great transition. But I think if we look a little deeper, we can see that the big unresolved dilemma still is the conflict between human progress that has been happening in this transition and environmental impact. There's lots of stuff. I could, I could show you lots of different ways of looking at human progress, but I particularly like this one uh, because it really talks about what's happening for ordinary people. Huge change in the lives of ordinary people. This chart, like all the ones we'll be using, stretches over 200 years from 1820 to 2020 um, because it's in that 200 year time period that most of the, uh, the global statistics really make an interesting shift. So we went 200 years ago from 94% of the world's population in extreme poverty. And I wouldn't worry too much about the details of those numbers, but just recognizing that it was very broad spread, basically everybody. Now down to the point where it's only 10% and continuing to fall. That's a huge, huge change. And I think it's not something, now that we're in the better side of that, it's not something to be discounted. But at the same time, if we look at humanity's ecological footprint, and I like this as probably the best way to sum up uh, humanity's uh, environmental impact, 
The ecological footprint measures how much of the Earth's biocapacity is humanity using at any time. It's sustainable biocapacity. And because it's sustainable biocapacity, we have the ability to go beyond it. And we did in 1970. And the way that one of the major ways that shows up is all the carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere now. So we are well beyond the Earth's capacity. We are in that kind of overshoot. We have to deal with it in one way or another. Fortunately, as you can see, a large part of the ecological footprint comes from the carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. So, and we have the capacity now to move to a renewable energy sources instead of being dependent on fossil fuels. So I wanna make the point that this is definitely something that we can overcome. We can also be more efficient in the way we use food, fiber, and timber. So this isn't a, 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 a sentence on humanity that we can't escape, but it is an issue that we need to deal with. So how are we gonna deal with it? Let's go back and look at some of those qualities um, that, uh, that we traced uh, coming into from, from the tribal to the empire. And now let's look at it in terms of the transition that we're in. So in the empire era with 90% of the population involved in agriculture, what have we moved to? Well, we've moved to very diverse livelihoods, also with much less poverty. If we go and look at when it was this elite written language, and where are we now? Well, among other things, over that same 200 years, we've gone from 12% adult literacy to 85% adult literacy. Essentially, the whole world now um, is, is literate which is a huge change. Plus our media now is much more multi-sense, visual, kinesthetic, as well as written. What about communications and travel? In the empire era, most people never got more than 50 miles away from where they were born. Their communications and their travel was very local. If you couldn't read or write, you had only speech uh, that also really limited it. There just wasn't a, mu a lot of movement that people were engaged in, engaged in. So it was a very local existence. Now, here's the statistics on world air passengers per year as a percent of the world population. It's currently up to 50%. That doesn't mean that 50% of the population gets on a plane because some people take more than one trip, but it's still a huge amount of, um, the, uh, of, the, of the world's population that is moving by airplane, which is in many ways is the most, um, takes you the furthest, let me put it that way. This doesn't count travel by um, surface transportation that uh, almost all the world is involved in that, that gets most people definitely further than 50 miles away from where they were born. And then in terms of communication, Here's the number of internet users um, as a proportion of the world's population and still growing among uh, youth between 15 and 24, it's, it's like 70% of the youth between 15 and 24. So we have definitely moved into that kind of global world. Also wanna add to this, here's mobile subscriptions as a percent of the world population almost 100%. Now that doesn't mean that everyone in the world has a, has a cell phone, uh, but what it does mean is it, it, this statistic comes out of the fact that some people have multiple subscriptions. But the thing that I will say with it is that uh, a, about 75% or more of the world's population has access to a cell phone. Again, that's huge. So we've moved from communication and travel as something very local to communication and travel as something that's worldwide. All right, how about those hierarchies, those violence enforced religiously sanctioned hierarchies? What are we moving to now? I wanna suggest that what we are moving to and already have moved to more than many people realize 
is networks and webs of relationships. Hierarchies work well when the tasks are routine and communication is cumbersome. They were an easy fit in the empire era. And, um, but networks work well in dynamic environments where people have choices and communication is widespread and easy, like what we have today. Ordinary people today have much more choice in their lives. Simple things like where to live, what occupation, whom to marry, but the list goes on and on beyond that. As a consequence, more and more of our social and economic life is based on choice and collaboration, often in networks or even looser webs of relationships. Rather than being contained in a single geography-based hierarchy, we participate in multiple networks. So from hierarchies to networks. But what about those dominators? In a networked world, leadership flows to skilled collaborators. Choice destroys the power of coercion. Rather than suffer dominators, people can simply choose to go elsewhere. And that elsewhere is increasingly two networks that involve skilled collaborators. The best collaborators are what I will call harmonizers. People connect to them by choice and they help networks function more effectively. I could also call them catalysts and cultivators and integrators and co-creators and many other such terms. It's a very robust role. It's fundamentally stronger and more enduring than the brittle dominator role. The most effective harmonizers embody what I'll call the three harmonies. The harmony within, the harmony with others, the harmony with nature. And because of especially the harmony within, they're agile, creative, resilient, and adaptive. And because of all those harmonies, they have the skills to bring about solutions to the world's problems in a way that dominators simply don't have those skills. They're able to catalyze rapid cultural evolution. And Essentially, anyone can become such a harmonizer. It's very much within the realm of our human capabilities. And you, it doesn't need to be an elite role. Unlike the dominators in the empire era, you can have a culture where everyone has the skills of being a harmonizer. And it's now become, because we've shifted to much more of a networked world, it's now become the smart path to success. It used just to just be an idealistic option. Now it's really the way to go. So we move from dominators to harmonizers and I'm calling what we're moving towards the planetary era because for us now the world is the whole planet. And just like the comparison before, these two are really different but it's no more different than the difference between the tribal era and the empire era. I do wanna emphasize that the characteristics from previous eras don't simply go away. They don't disappear, but they become transformed. So we still have kinship. We, we will still in the planetary era have some forms of hierarchy, but not the enforced hierarchy. We still have speech, we still have writing, even with our multimedia communications. There's still forms of hunting and gathering, and there's still agriculture, even in as part of the occupational diversity. We aren't there yet. We aren't to the planetary era yet. We'll be able to fully arrive um, when we replace the cultural patterns built by and for dominators with new patterns catalyzed by harmonizers for everyone's benefits. And then we can really fulfill that vision of humanity and harmony with the earth. I wanna say again, we know how to do it technically. It's, it's really a, a beautiful example of this is the drawdown project relating to how to uh, overcome uh, the issues of climate change. But we're paralyzed by cultural patterns developed in a very different world that just don't fit anymore. We need rapid cultural evolution. 
and trying to push for that, we'll just get pushback in today's world. What we need instead is future pull. We need a sense of the possibilities that we're moving towards. And networks will lead the way for that because hierarchies are too rigid and lack the creative capacity to truly build new culture. And in turn, harmonizers will catalyze the networks. And this is where all of this big picture that I've been talking about connects to you and what you can do. And so this leads me to Context Institute's Bright Future strategy. The Bright Future Now course is designed to deepen the participants' abilities to embody the three harmonies. So it's a way of helping people move more fully into that harmonizer role. The Bright Future Network provides mutual support among harmonizers. And these harmonizers develop and spread new planetary era cultural patterns. And the whole program is a strategic accelerator for rapid, timely cultural change. And here's the plug. If you're interested in the program, registration for the fall course ends in just two weeks. We have the winds of cultural evolution at our backs, but we must raise our sails. So I hope you will join us in that process and raise your sail with us. Thanks. We're going to now share with you, because I can't resist this, I want to share with you some of the wonderful people who are part of the Bright Future Network. And so with some quick self-introductions, uh, let me start with Mindy. Mindy? Thanks so much, Robert. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mindy Jones. I live in Washington, DC, and I was in the spring 2017 Bright Future Now course. For work, I partner with nonprofits and businesses to reach their constituents or customers online. And right now I'm particularly interested in projects that honor the entire lifespan and elevate the way we view aging and age diversity. Hello, my name is uh, Joris Blankers. I live in Utrecht, the center of the Netherlands. I was part of the spring course in 2017, really enjoyed it. I'm a social entrepreneur and coach. I found some companies in arts, sports and education and uh, organize peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning for uh, educational, entrepreneurial educational leaders. Um, my name is Heather Johnson. I am executive director of the Whidbey Institute that is in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in Washington State. Uh, we have a 100-acre learning center uh, gathering, uh, it's a space to gather people into deep multi-day uh, learning experiences that are really about supporting the shift from empire era to planetary era. So it's all in service of this work, and yet we're in a steep learning curve for how is it that we actually do that? So I participated in the spring session, and um, I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. Hi, I'm Santon, connecting from South Africa. I live with my two-year-old son and partner. Um, I'm a businessman who uses business as a vehicle to bring about change in our planet. Uh, I work with a distributed uh, team working from Romania, Argentina, and South Africa. For most of my adult life, I carried my home and my office in my backpack, traveling around the world. Um, I'm working on a new economic system called Rebellion, which nurtures all of life and uh, regenerates ecosystems. Hello, my name is Kai Gabels. I live in the southwest part of Germany in a village close to Heidelberg. I was participating the course in uh, January this year. Um, for a living, I have a I work as an electrical engineer. I have a staff position in a global electrical engineering company. And I also have a role in a public project in Germany uh, where ministries, academia, and industry work together on the digitalization of industry. Hi, this is uh, Spring Cheng. I live in Seattle, Washington. Um, I'm the uh, co-founder of Resonance Path Institute. And our institute is um, very much uh, along the line of what Robert is talking about, about the change of uh, cultural patterns. And uh, the uh, thing we're particularly interested in is um, if the old way of ch making change, like uh, Robert said, the push and pull, is like playing boxing, then the kind of change we're interested in is how do we do Tai Chi um, 
Tai Chi. Yeah, so our work is uh, um, finding the harmonizing middle way between the Eastern culture and the Western culture, the more individualistic and the collective culture, how to find the path middle way in between. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Greenberg. I wear a number of hats. I, I've started a consultancy called CAPE, which develops custom academic programs in eco-villages. Uh, also Earth Deeds, which offers a more meaningful alternative to carbon offsetting. And I'm also the president of the Global Eco-Village Network. And I'm also getting into voiceover work, which is why you see this microphone here. Hi, I'm Olivia Alfonso. Um, I live in New York City and I was a part of the winter 2017 course. I'm a racial justice activist for a living, and my work focuses on Long Island, uh, New York, where I'm from. And in particular, I focus on um, racial segregation and inequities in housing and education. Hi, uh, my name is Arun Vaklu, and I'm from Pune, India. I was part of the summer 2017 uh, program of the uh, BFN. Uh, I am the founder, chairman of a company called uh, Pragati Leadership, which works to develop wholesome leaders. I have written several books, but my favorite one is called One Wholesome World, which is a manual for moving into the planetary era of joy, peace, and abundance for all. Hi from Los Angeles, everybody. I'm Mitra Martin, and um, I was part of the spring 2017 cohort. Um, I'm prototyping an approach to social change that I'm calling the Tango Hatchery. Um, and the aim is renewing communities by changing how we learn together. Um, so it builds on principles from improvised, partnered uh, folk dance traditions, including my specialty, which is Argentine Tango. Thank you, Mitra. What we'd like to do next is to just do another round, but this a round where the, the graduates get to share a little bit of their experience uh, with the course, the network, whatever it is that they feel they want to do. And so again, I'd like to start the round off uh, turning to you, Mindy. Thanks so much, Robert. Um, the benefits of the Bright Future Now course and being in the Bright Future network, network for me are many and varied, but as I thought about it this past week in preparation for this, I think they can really be distilled down to two things. And that's that I'm more comfortable and more free than I was before I took this course. And that allows me to be more useful to myself and to others. So a lot of tools that we gather in the course are geared towards getting a higher level, longer and more complete view of whatever it is we're looking at. And it could be anything, a complex political situation, a business move, a personal relationship, what it is doesn't really matter as much as the frameworks that you use to think about it. And that more complete view helps me be more creative at work, more flexible with myself and others, more accurate in my assessments, and probably most importantly, more secure. And that allows me to be braver, braver when bravery is called for, or more patient when patience is called for. And it just really makes me a lot more resilient. I'm I'm not bothered by all the things I used to be bothered by, and that's true of the larger world, but especially of my personal relationships. And that has freed up a lot of emotional and mental energy that I can now apply to anything I choose. And I'm better at choosing now because I have that longer view and a more complete view. So I'll just give two quick concrete examples and wrap up. Um, one, I have more productive, less contentious <coughs> conversations with the people I love, even on topics where we really disagree. And I've always been a pretty creative thinker and problem solver, especially at work, but that comes even more easily to me now. I can come up with useful, practical answers to tough questions more quickly. And I've also come up with some good ideas that I just never would have thought of before, no matter how quickly or slowly I worked. So I just, I feel really good about, about those specific things and also about their underlying foundation of feeling more comfortable and more free. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Mindy. Let me continue what I uh, um, understand for, but I was also like many people, I guess, uh, quite delusioned with, uh, with how the world is. There are many positive worldviews or very much negative worldviews, and I simply don't know uh, what's right and what's wrong. And I read tons of books on all different topics, and uh, come to new in this course, uh, it's so integrated. It got uh, it got various topics from psychology, from ecology, all uh, integrated in that course, and that gave me some 
new positive perspective. Um, I have children and I really want to give uh, my two little daughters some perspective. As a father, you have some sort of right to, yeah, to, to bring them on in a new world. And the Context Institute really gave me yeah, a new perspective and a way of dealing with all those very complicated stuff and make it actually a lot of fun and also do it with, uh, with an international group, not only from my own small perspective in Europe, but yeah, to really see and talk it through with people from Senegal, from China, from all over the world. And that, yeah, that really comforts me, but also gives me the stability and, and zest to really uh, bring the, the bright future uh, forward. And as a last very good topic, um, it's not from a religious standpoint, not from ecological standpoint or systemic. It's somehow a, a language that's quite uh, understandable for everybody. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's real nice. Uh, for me, big thing, uh, context. <laughs> There's something about um, and all of the noise, all of the sense of the aspirations that we have, the hopes that we have. We also come to this work with a lot of preferences and preferences that are, pre you, know, you know, frequently at the expense of or pushing away um, ways of being that are also still important for us to hold and, and in that a lot of shadows. So what I was so grateful for in the experience was having this, this you know, really systemic picture of here are all the parts and, and, uh, and this is how all the parts tie together. And then within these parts, um, being able to explore, um, I want to be careful not to reveal the content. And um, there were two particular parts that spoke to me at a particular moment, exactly when I needed. And it had to do with decision making and leadership. So decision making uh, with uh, a lot of people who are drawn to the desire to move towards planetary way of being, we have preferences and will prefer particular kinds of leadership making uh, approaches. And they can be at the expense of really important decision-making structures that are important for particular moments or, or, or circumstances. So there's, for me, a key part of the gift of all of this was poking into some of the shadows and some of the, the preferences that prevent us from actually being able to be effective in bring, bringing the planetary era way of being into being. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Heather. Um, so one of my favorite words in the English language is serendipity. And um, I find I find the course coming to my life in a serendipitous time um, because I, I've had this project that I've that I've been so passionate and, and enthusiastic about, but I didn't I didn't have the tools. I felt like I didn't have the tools or the language to clearly express and explore this project. So the first the first part of um, doing the bright future course that stood out for me was a potent introduction to systems thinking. It allowed me to see the project uh, in different, smaller, chewable components that I could then visualize and form a clearer picture of, and then see how these components were connected to the whole. So the course helped me. It helped me get this deep sense of satisfaction to know that hey, this this project is, is now doable. I, I found the tools within the course to 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 explore this project more deeply and actually have some kind of um, practical movement forward. Um, the other part of the of, of doing the course that I found deeply satisfying is connecting with this um, with this network of people, amazing people around the world, um, people who are deeply concerned about the situation of our planet and at the same time enthusiastic and having fun with creating solutions to the challenges we face. Okay, so um, for me the course was um, very helpful uh, also in my day job. So in, in the both parts of my job that I explained, uh, I have to bring forward things without a lot of authority. And the main thing I learned in the course is to really uh, have a good and systematic way to build common ground with the people uh, I work with. And um, maybe I can spoil a little bit, so you will learn about describing aspects uh, as territories that you explore, and you are using maps like you do in a, in a hiking tour. And if you have disagreement in a group, usually somebody is just using a different map for that same territory because he has other interests, other 
driving factors and so on. So, and the tools that, that uh, I learned in the course were really extremely um, helpful to bring people together and also to approach bigger projects and bigger networks. Another thing I would like to mention is that you learn really a lot of small, very helpful things. Maybe one thing I, I can mention here, uh, Robert taught us something called the inner glow, which really is for me one of the major tools to, to deal with stage fright or to prepare a meeting in a, in a very good uh, way. And these are just very simple tools that um, make you more effective and that also left me much more content um, with my professional and private life. This is a uh, spring. Um, I, what I'd like to share about my experience with this course is um, the vision that I got connected to. Um, it connect me to a deep, a wider world outside and also a deeper uh, version of self inside of me. Um, having this uh, um, broad perspective of history, uh, human evolution, and the uh, different ways our um, cultural pattern works um, provided me tools and agency um, that allows me to work, walk in the world very differently than before. Um, and I'm able to do that with, within a community of people who share the same language and uh, mm, uh, tool set. Um, in fact, some of the people's become my very um, close colleague um, and we're uh, building our own network that start to proliferate. Um, and also I want to say that the, the, um, the bright future, um, it also actually allows me to, um, um, like what Heather Johnson was sharing, allows me to um, actually go into deeper into the shadow. And that's how we get to the bright part is to going through the shadow. And uh, this course really provides a lot of um, tools, resource and support for doing that. Hi everyone. Uh, Daniel, I was part of the inaugural group, I guess it was April, May of 2016. So I'm actually curious how it's changed since then. Um, the course, the coursework was wonderful. It was really great connecting with people and being part of this growing, growing network of change makers around the world. Just yesterday, I had an, a wonderful hour long conversation with Mitra. Um, and I think one of the most powerful aspects of the program for me was really the sort of the what time is it framework that uh, Robert uh, talked about a little bit at the beginning of this webinar. And I find so many people, I talk to so many people that are depressed or anxious or not hopeful. And I think there was a study that said like 90% of people, at least in the US, uh, when asked the future of humanity, just said, well, it's built in that we're going to be at war, we're going to have conflict and violence, and that's never going to change. And it's sad uh, that that people have such a perspective that it's just actually going to get worse for them. And so I think the framework that Robert has created is the simplest and really most straightforward perspective worldview story, as it were, of where are we in planetary, uh, planetary time. And it's helped me really see okay, I understand that there's conflict. I understand that there's these challenges and it makes sense because we're in between stories. And when I share that with people, I, I had the opportunity to really uh, uh, offer some of his, uh, of this idea in a course in the Gambia a couple of years ago and was just amazed at how deeply it sunk in for people. They're like, oh, wow, this is hopeful. I can actually understand this better and I can really move forward with, uh, with uh, more excitement and positivity. So, and it's wonderful that the, the network is growing. I've participated some with the online forums, but it's, it's really cool to see those uh, blossoming and taking root and different sprouts are coming up. And I think there's something for everyone and all of it. So thank you everyone. Yeah, so I've definitely had very similar experiences that Daniel just described in terms of talking to people and actually giving them hope rather than thinking that we're moving further into an era of doom and gloom. So. Um, I can um, echo that point for sure. And to add to that, for me in the social justice, you know, nonprofit world, 
I've seen that many nonprofits tend to um, have a really hard time forming partnerships because their work tends to be very specific on a specific cause in a specific geographic area. So for me, this course has really allowed me to help these organizations come together and see their issues as being related um, and facilitate these partnerships. So that's been really powerful. Uh, hey, everyone. So um, what stands out for me is really the, um, the mood of the course and the network. It feels um, optimistic and grounded and intelligent and just really drama free. <laughs> um, and it, it sensitized me to the ways I have actually, without even knowing it, sort of brought subtle forms of stress or ego into learning experiences that I've facilitated or participated in in the past, you know, just carrying forward my own um, uh, empire era dynamics. Uh, so it made me aware of that on a conscious level. And um, at the same time, you know, also providing a model of a really mature and gentle and wise learning community, um, which I'm really excited to take forward in my work. Um, and uh, part of that learning community is this sort of seedbed of uh, relationships and uh, collaborations that um, is, you know, we share the same language, values, and principles, you know, it, you know a, a certain set of those tools. Um, and yet there's just this huge diversity of uh, ways of going about change. Um, and a huge diversity of life stages, which um, is uh, truly valuable for me to be able to learn from people who have many decades more experience on this planet um, and are still open and, and um, you know, truly inspired to share and collaborate and, and build, you know, build that new magnetic future. Well, thank you all. I think that will help others get more of a sense, a, a much richer, di more dimensional sense of what it is that, we're, that we all have been experiencing. And at this point, I'd like to open things up to questions uh, from the audience and um, turn it back to Mindy, who's been caretaking that. Mindy, go ahead. Thanks, Robert. Um, so I have collected the questions that folks have submitted. Thank you so much. These are really great questions and I'm excited to get started. Um, I will start with a question from Roger who first gave a comment just that this is a great group of, um, what an amazing group of people and what a great diversity of approaches to the transition of our times. That was from Roger. And he also asked for a quick um, clarification on the footprint slide, Robert, um, where you are showing kind of our ecological footprint over time. What is the built category? It's down at the bottom of the slide. And um, yeah, that's the amount of ecological footprint that comes out of the built environment, including things like, you know, not only buildings, but roads and harbors and all the other stuff uh, that uh, uses up land um, and has an ecological footprint that goes with it. Great. Thank you. Um, so next we have a question from Richard, and it's for you, Robert, and I'll just read it aloud here. Um, I've spent the past nine years studying a history of human development in the interest of transparency. I am not a scholar, but have studied the work of the Big History Project and other sources to develop this sense. Like yourself, there are many visionaries out there that are very cognizant of the broader problems. My greatest concern is what will be the best approach to utilize with the general public in teaching this history such that it impacts them at an emotional level, which will deepen their appreciation for the role we play at this point in time and going forward from the present moment. My concern is that the political and economic climate worldwide is such that most people are in survival mode. Bottom line question, what will make them listen? What will draw them into the new paradigm of relationship? Namaste. I, I think that actually that uh, Arun, who uh, unfortunately needed to drop off, um, also had a, a good response to that in terms of conversations from the heart. Uh, and, and I will say that part of my approach to cultural change is to work not on broadcast, but on what's sometimes described as the diffusion of innovations. That it, so you work initially with early adopters and get cultural change to spread in that way. 
Um, so I, the, it, the question of what we can do at this point in broadcast terms for um, large numbers of people, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think there is some stuff in the what time is it framework, the, the tribal uh, empire planetary framework that could be shared on a broad scale. And in fact, we've got somebody in the network who's working on a documentary uh, called The Arc of Humanity, uh, which is based around that. Uh, however, for a lot of what we're doing, the focus is on actually building new cultural DNA, building new patterns, not, not just having conversation sessions, but actually making changes on the ground uh, and allowing those changes to influence how people feel and what they experience. My sense is that for the majority of people, they're much less influenced by ideas than they are by seeing things that work. And so the job for people who want to move things forward is to get things that work. Great. And we have a related question from, from Joe and I'll, it's, I think your answer will overlap, but it might illuminate a couple other things. So I want to read this one as well. Great historical uh, un way of understanding the potential of the future, particularly clear, regarding why war worked in the past. However, in the past, wars and global resources were not self-limited until we feared total destruction. So does our harmony depend on that feared end? In other words, how, does, how do even 90% of us harmonizers succeed over the few with real power, not seeing or caring about world risks? Power is still in the hands of a few not saying your tools and views aren't significant, but we still need to understand the reality of our current empire power centers. Mm -hmm. Part of what I would say here is yes and. Uh, I, I feel we actually have more power than we realize and we grant more power to the old power centers, which doesn't mean that they don't have power, they do, but um, they have much less creative power, they are much more constrained uh, if you if you talk to people on the inside, they will talk about how constrained they are. Um, it, and so I, I think the dance for us now is we, I mean, we are in a race, if you will, um, uh, between being able to move things forward and, and having them uh, sort of collapse around us. Uh, and the best way here, I'll say I'm in agreement with Buck, Buckminster Fuller when he says that the best way to change things is to make them obsolete. So the best way to change those power centers is to make them obsolete. Um, and that is not something that happens overnight, but it is something that is increasingly happening. Uh, and most of us haven't caught up to the degree to which it has. Uh, I would say at the moment, we have this fabulous demonstration by a, a dominator style type President of the United States, who is illustrating how little power he actually has. Unfortunately, he still has levers on some significant power that could do some real damage. But I hope everyone is, is gathering the degree to which, compared to an ancient emperor in one of those agrarian empires, uh, he's out there, you know, trying to get this to happen, trying to get that to happen. We live in a much more complex networked world. Uh, these days, and unless you uh, move through attraction, um, it, it there's so easy. It's so easy to resist. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Great. Well, that's actually our last question. Um, okay. But right. if anybody has any other quickly, we can we can get to them too. Mitra, oh. do you have something? Yeah, I could just build on, a bit on what uh, Robert was sharing and. Uh, I do agree that um, you know experiences and things that work are so much more compelling than ideas. Um, and I guess I feel like it, my experience is that when people find a, a space or um, an experience that is truly enchanting in some way, um, that has space for uh, the body and sensation and emotion and improvisation and all these parts of ourselves that really were not so much a part of the empire era. When, when we're able to discover and experience um, those types of contexts and how we feel in those contexts and what those contexts bring out of us, 
there's sort of a magnetism that holds interest and creates momentum. And so um, I see uh, part of our work is, as discovering how to, how to build those contexts and invite people um, to inhabit them uh, and get over the fears or vulnerabilities that they may have um, in encountering something a little bit unfamiliar. So uh, we, most of us have heard the phrase, uh, there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And I would say that's even more true for a story whose time has come. And I think that's what Robert has really outlined here about how our opportunities and restrictions are essentially tied to the stories we tell ourselves. And sometimes new stories are defined through their opposite. And I think that's what's happening, particularly in the U.S. now, when we have a president who just is so barefaced empire and people are like, oh, you know, it's like lifting a veil. It's like seeing the story so clearly that people are more able to choose something else. And I think there's so many people now in the U.S. and North America and around the world that are looking for something else. Many of them have a glimmer of what that can be. Many of them are moving in that direction. And I think Bright Future, Future Now is saying, hey, <laughs> come join us. We're, we're here. We're in the planetary era. We're trying to live this new story. We're, we're playing it out. We're, we're, we're trying to live into it. And it's exciting. And it's actually much more fun than anything else we've been doing on this planet so far. Yeah. I'd love to follow up with that on um, I, one of the most precious conversations um, you know, I've had with Robert is about how how is how we're trying to bring the planetary era into being through empire tactics. And, and it just doesn't work and it won't work. And, and that, um, you know, so many, I, I mean, having been involved in sustainability work and positive change work and cultural change work uh, for 15, 20 years, I see a lot of the tactics of, of the, of what we're trying to do still, um, still grounded in if they would be different, we would be okay. And so assuming that the positive change work is about changing them. And what I, what I experienced through this is, is, um, that it's a really it's a shift of a way of being it's a shift of a way of engaging and that and that planetary era um, you know is emerging and how are we actually in the way by trying to get people to be different and how is it that 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 all of this is a process of learning and becoming and maturing and growing thank you all many thanks to all of you who have been panelists many thanks to all of you who have been watching this um, and uh, to those who have uh, submitted questions. This has been being recorded and we will get the recording up um, and available and get the word out as to uh, where it is. Uh, and if uh, for any of you who are interested in taking Bright Future Now and being part of the Bright Future Now course, uh, I would encourage you to look at context.org and you will find the links that you need there to find out more about the course. And uh, if you're interested, register for the course. Just remind you that registration closes in two weeks. Um, so thank you all. Um, and I think at this point, we will say it's a wrap. Thanks. <laughs>